welcome, all and good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching or listening to this, and welcome to this week's episode of the Non-Identity Podcast. Now, this week, we're joined by an uh, ex-professional wrestler and the head honcho of the Anti-Social Network. Ooh, head hunter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Bob Wilds. Hi, hi, boss man. Welcome to the show. <laughs> you goddamn got that right, dude. I am a head hunter. I'm yeah. always looking for top-of-the-line talent like yourself to come hang out with us. <laughs> Uh, before we get into uh, the anti-social network and what it is, you just want to tell everyone a bit about yourself and where you grew up and what childhood was like and shit. I mean, yeah, childhood. Everybody fucking has a sob story or happy stories about their childhood. Fuck all that. What I did was I grew up watching the WWF, WCW. In fact, how I was introduced to wrestling was, you know, see, when I was a kid, I was I was the shit, right? Because I had one of those little tiny black and white TVs in my bedroom. Yeah. And back in the you know, back in the 80s, that meant something. <laughs> and uh, I hear all the uh, 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 my dad had the neighborhood dads over and they're all screaming and hooting and carrying on. And finally, I, I figured they were watching football. Finally, I went out there to peek at what was going on. I came out just in time to see Hulk Hogan and Roddy Piper. Just throwing heat back and forth. Boom, 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 boom. And I was like. So I just kind of sat down on the floor right in the middle of the room and I was watching it when it was over. I mean, I saw Mr. T. I was like, oh, my God, it's Mr. T. I was amazed by the spectacle that I'm looking at. And I said, what is this? And he goes, oh, that's Hulk Hogan and Rowdy Roddy Piper. And that's a really good guy and a really bad guy. And I said. That's what I'm going to do when I grow up. And, you know, my dad, he's like, oh, of course you can, son. Of course you will. Imagine his fucking dismay when I actually followed through and did it. (laughs) So how did you go about the journey? Because obviously you hear a lot of ex-wrestlers and they say that, like, hit tight and rest in school when money was tight. Were you in that area? And obviously the kayfabe side of stuff. Was you all in that era when you was doing your training and stuff? Oh God, like yeah. Well, the thing is, uh, me and old Doug Damien, also from the network, we do ghosted together, and uh, we met in high school. He was making this uh, wooden in a shop class. He was making this wooden, the old WWF logo. It oh, was wow. cool as hell. And I said, "Oh, that's awesome." I said, "Yeah, I want to do that someday." And he looked up and went, "Oh shit, me too." Is that right? And then we've been kicking it ever since. But we looked at, we knew we had to go find a school. We looked everywhere. And we were just running into dead ends after dead ends after dead ends. And Jesus Christ, we even went and snuck into a private session that Macho Man was doing. In fact, that's that's a good story because I got I got immediately irritated when we got up to the table that we literally should not have been in that room. <laughs> and we sneak up to the table and he goes, you know, what's your name? Uh, and Doug's like, oh, shit, okay. So he's a Doug. And Randy starts filling out his little autograph, you know, and, and he's like, you okay? And now Doug goes, hey, so me and my friend here, Randy hadn't looked at us once yet. Uh, me and my friend here are looking everywhere for a wrestling school. Can you help us out? And, I don't know about them. There's a lot of good ones out there. And that irritated the piss out of me. So I just walk away. And Doug's like, well, he's he's continuing the conversation, not seeing that I'd walked away. So he's doing this. Come on, man. Me and my friend right here, you know, we've been looking everywhere. We can't find. We're really looking. And he finally looks up and see Doug doing this to nobody. So me and my friend here. And he's like, yeah, I can't help you out, man. He gave him the picture, and he walks up and slaps me in the back of the head. You cocksucker, I was over there babbling away, and he looks up and sees me talking to my imaginary friend, and he jaded me. And I said really loud, well, fuck, macho man, let's go. And we left. Well, that that gimmick worked for our truth for little Jimmy, having an imaginary friend. So it got over at some point. (laughs) And yeah, but you know what's funny is uh, Randy actually remembered that story when I met him the next time, and I reminded him. He's like, "Yeah, in Sacramento, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> how's that guy doing?" <laughs> Immediately, I flipped out and called Doug, dude. Randy remembered, but um, <laughs> we finally find the Malenko School out in Miami, 
and we're like we're gearing up to move from California to Florida to get to begin our journey. So we uh, get tickets to the WWF show at Arco Arena in Sacramento. And man, we went gimmick. I put on a macho man beard and I got my jacket and I put tassels on it in the big hat. And we went out, we had ringside tickets and Doug dressed up as Diesel. So we have the full Diesel fucking fit going on, man. And we were marking the boys out. We were going so Mark tarted every time they came to the ring. We were popping for the heels. Like the dudes in the back, turns out, were talking about us. But at intermission, we go up there to the uh, snack area, and this guy walks up behind me, and he goes, you boys are fun. Are you guys wrestlers? And I chuckled a little, but I said, no, no, sir. I didn't even turn around. The guy was behind me. No, no, sir. I I'm sure not. Do you want to be? And I turned around and it was Paul fucking DeMarco standing in front of me. And I froze. And he goes, oh, so you know who I am? Uh, 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 I have a school right here in town. So we went to the uh, Pro I Am Pro Wrestling Academy instead of the Malinkos with uh, Mr. DeMarco, who was all about that old school and that kayfabe. So he beat it into our heads. <laughs> Yeah, no, because uh, obviously when you hear Hulk Hogan speak, he speaks about having his leg broken and that to see if he would come back the next day and stuff. Did they put you through stuff like that? No, certainly. I, I Look, I love Hogan. I love, love, love Hogan. I don't believe that story. I believe he broke his leg, but I don't believe they broke his leg just to see. No, no, but he did. He, he beat the shit out of me a lot just to see if I had what it took, but like breaking something or causing any actual damage? No, certainly not. And when do you sort of get told, like, it, this is scripted and this is how we're going to dance? Is it, I, like I say, I'm a big wrestling fan, and I see it like a, a storytelling, storytelling through dance and art and stuff like that. When do you get told that within school? Because obviously growing up, it's two guys beating the shit out of each other. <laughs> well... When I did a walk up with Mr. DeMarco, like he was first giving me some hands on time, I leaned in and whispered, so is this all fake? And he reaches, he switched his hand to the back of my neck and took his elbow and shoved it right through the side of my face. So when I woke up, he was fucking hot, man. And I was like, oh, shit, he was getting ready to kick me out. Like, you don't say the F word to me. So all he says, come back in next, come back in in a couple days, the next schedule, and you've got to get in the ring and you've got to take it to Paul or he's not going to respect you. He's going to wash you out. So I did. And then uh, after I kicked him in the stomach and gave him one of my own elbows in his face, he looked up at me and said, that's it, kid. Freak out. And then we were friends. <laughs> because that's been, I agree. I hate the word home fake for wrestlers. Because to me, it's an art form. Throwing your body and doing it to yourself in a way of, around for half an hour and stuff, there's nothing fake about it. <laughs> you know well, I mean? that's why we, we don't call it fake. We call it a work. Yeah. Because uh, we're beating, we're beating the legitimate shit out of each other every single time we get in those ropes. Yeah. You know, people say, oh, well, it's like landing on a, on a mattress or a trampoline. And that always just, I always say, you know what? I'll tell you what. Hop in here, and I'm not even going to be me. I'll just scoop you up. I'll give you one regular old body slam. You hit the mat and you tell me how fucking fake that feels. A couple of people have taken me up on it. <laughs> I never drilled them. I just pick them up and put them down. And they're That's like, never, as a child, I used to see judo, which is obviously rubbish martial arts, the gentle way, really. And to just be thrown and then stand back up and then be thrown again, that was yeah. exhausting. <laughs> To do that with like throwing body shots and arm locks and stuff like that, you can't imagine how much physical pressure you're putting through your body. <laughs> no, yeah. and the thing is, like the, the generation, like the generation that like me and Chris Casanova and whatnot came out of, we were kind of, I feel like, the last of the generations of wrestlers. Because uh, like DeMarco, uh, Chris trained over at the uh, 
APW in Hayward, California. And, you know, these guys were all pretty much saying, look, man, if shit gets squirrely in the ring and somebody goes to you and you don't know how to defend yourself, you're going to get fucked up. So you are going to know how to actually wrestle. You know, guys came in usually with some kind of an amateur background in the first place, but uh, the kind of wrestlers that we come from, you know, back then the business would get really real, really fast. And it would be over quick, but if you couldn't defend yourself or handle yourself on your own attacks, then you're fucked. And the wrestlers who've been turning out since then, probably not so much focused on learning how to shoot, which means that they're not so focused on their craft. They're more impressed with like, how many backflips can I do rather than what happens if wild thing double legs me and fucking tries to put me to sleep. <laughs> Exactly. Um, when you got to your first show, how did you feel? Was you nervous? Was you ready? God, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I almost pee peed myself right in my tights. Wow. I was a curtain jerk. I was nobody. The whole crowd wasn't even there yet. But God damn it, I had to go out there and perform. And I did. Probably not, you know, great. But I didn't get booed. You know, no, no, nobody in the back said, boy, you stunk that shit, didn't you? So it was okay. And uh, what's one of your greatest matches that you remember having? There's probably loads, but what's one that sticks out for you? You know, I, I used to say a match with Raven, but that has been superseded by a match with none other than Chris Casanova. That was probably <laughs> my greatest match. So uh, it was at a Nickelback concert. And this promoter showed up, but he set up like he was the main stage and where they all got together. Then there was a walkway, the beer garden, and there was a ring and a, like a couple of tents set up for a dressing room. So we, they would do a band, then come out and do a couple of matches. And it got down to the main event that was me and Chris. And then Nickelback was going to come on. So they put these fucking guys on right before us who were the shits. They were absolutely garbage to the point where we lost the crowd. By the time we're supposed to go to the ring, there was like six people still hanging around to see what happens next. They were that bad that they lost a crowd of like, you know, probably a, a hundred hang arounders. And Chris is fucking heated, dude, because we got this table, but we had this table brought so we could use it in our match. And those cunts tried to use it in theirs, except those two fat asses couldn't break the table because it was way too solid now chris is fucking hot he's like well now what now let's just grab our shit and go then I'm like well no let's just uh go out there and get him and bring him back oh all right so that's what we did we got in the ring we got our heat we did about maybe two minutes in the ring i threw him out the ring gave him a suplex we kicked the fucking barricade down and we took it out we took it to the beer garden we took it through the crowd in front of the stage. We got up on the fucking stage. We brought hundreds of people back to the ring with us. And as we found out later on, the guys in Nickelback had popped their hoodies up and put their caps on, and they followed over and watched. Wow. And it was just, and it, and it really was a very skillfully worked match for being what we were trying to accomplish. Like, obviously, I'm not going to hit him with any kind of, a, you know, a, a spike suplex or anything like that out there on the concrete. But for what we had to work with, we did very, very well. We finally get everybody back to the ring, grab that table and throw it in. And the crowd's like, fuck, yeah, here we go. And I did the spot where I put the table up in the corner and I whipped him into it and he ran into that table and boom, he bounced off and hit the ground and went, oh, and I was like, oh, shit. So I picked him up, grabbed him for a suplex, went to suplex into that table in the corner and we both bounced off. <laughs> and I was like, Jesus Christ. So I put him against the table and I drop kicked it and we bounced off for a third time. Fuck the table, let's just go home. And Chris looks up at me and he's mad. Fucking that table is breaking. Okay, so I grabbed him. And this time I legit whipped him out as hard as I could. He ran. I mean, I threw him out so bad that my feet kicked out from under me and I went down to my belly. 
as he is charging that table, dug that shoulder in and spiked it. Finally, it broke. This crowd went banana sandwiches, man. Lost their shit. And then I scooped him up to get ready to give him my finisher. And he hits me with a small package. One, two, oh, and barely a kick out. Then I hit my finish because that was kind of my last actual match. I was going to get my knees fixed. But boy, oh boy, dude, we fucking blew that place to pieces. And we did it in such a manner where most wrestlers, I believe, would just say, well, this is lost. Let's go out there and just bullshit for 10 minutes in front of these six people. And we said, no, we're going to go for 45 minutes and we're going to go get all of them and bring them back. <laughs> That's great. Now, you talk about your knees were shot and stuff like that. How did you cope with injury along the way? Because obviously there's lots of stories about with the pros falling into the substance and stuff like that because they're getting their body to repair. Was you in that culture or did you find another way to? No, I didn't really uh, fall into drug addiction until I was actually out of active wrestling. It was a whole different shitty part of life. But no, man, uh, Mike, how I coped with injuries was uh, ace bandages and wraps, Advil, and, and get the fuck to work because <laughs> that's what we do. Like that, uh, that, that, another great match was uh, from wrestling school. One more time. Was that, was that the mentality you had drummed into you from wrestling school? No matter how beat up yeah. you are, you go out and work. Yeah, you go to fucking work. Yeah, that's what you do. You're booked. People paid their money to escape their lives for a little bit. So go do what the fuck they just paid you to do. Go do it. If you can't do it, then you're not in the right business. And like uh, I wrestled Doug Damien because he had uh, dislocated his shoulder and actually done tendon damage uh, during a match with me where I put the hardcore championship on it. So we went to the doctor, got the x-rays and went, uh oh, you know, like I, I actually got to go ahead and get out of this. So I said, all right, let's have a big rematch. Let's really pump it up for a little bit while your shoulder heals. We'll be real quick. We'll do it for like eight minutes. I'll get the belt back off you. We're going to let you go out like a good guy. And then you could just ride off into the sunset. Okay. So we get into the ring. And we're standing across from each other. The bell rings. I took one step forward. Exploded my knee. Went down like a sack of shit. Now, thankfully, uh, this lady, Connie, who was the, uh, you know, the uh, commissioner of the company came out was like oh you guys don't come out here and fight when you decide you get your ass back to the locker room i'll tell you when you're gonna fight so immediately and that was the first match that's how we started the show we go to the back they bring out the second match and doug's like okay so i guess we just put this off right now i was like no fuck that we can't just not do it he goes you just blew your knee what are we gonna do and we're we're sitting behind a curtain on a stage there was a DJ set up up here who was running all the sound and all the lights. <clears throat> and we were going to have a hardcore match. So I said, just uh, go with my lead and please be gentle on my knee and just listen to everything I say and I'm going to get us through this. And he's like, fuck, all right. So when the match bell rang and the music was playing, I took a stop sign and just started wailing it against the wall behind the curtain. And I kicked a chair and I threw a chair and I said, go. And then Doug threw himself through the curtain and tumbled out, boom, 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 onto the stage. And I come gimping out with that stop sign. Come on, champ. Yeah, boy. You think the show's over? And we're just doing our thing. And he gets me down. He starts gently working my knee like he's just killing me. Anyway, we ended up taking it home to where he pretty much carried me to the ring, got me into the ring, and then I fucking sucker punched him, hit him with a garbage can, Worked his bad shoulder gimmick by putting him in a cross face until the pain was just too great and he could no longer endure and he passed out. Then we did the gimmick where he woke up and he's like, what the fuck? And he snatched the belt back and Michael Porter, no, 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 Rob beat you and blah, blah. You guys have been friends for so long. And then we made up and we hugged. Then the commissioner comes out to get him some more baby face heat by, you know, oh, you guys don't just get to run off into the sunset. This isn't over. We looked at her, just pointed and started laughing, walked away. Doug got to go out like a million bucks. We got the belt back and I went and got my surgeries and got all patched up. But the show has to go on. 
No, exactly. Um, your character, did you draw off of other people? Was it a close resemblance to Rob the person? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, originally the Ripper. Yeah. And uh, I was the heavy metal maniac. And I wasn't digging any of those. But this woman, this little old lady walks up to me after a show and she goes, oh, you're Ripper. You're that wild guy. And I was like, yeah, OK, Ripper Wilds. Let's give that a try. And then I just decided, fuck, Ripper is stupid. I'm going to start being Rob Wilds. But I used to spell it with the Y in it like Zach Wilds did. Figured, you know, I don't want to get in trouble, so I'm just going to change it up. And then I kept doing different monikers, but it was always Rob Wilds. So it was the stalker Rob Wilds, the black diamond Rob Wilds, running through all these things. And I'm sitting with my uh, manager-to-be at the time, and we're watching a, a league of their own. Yeah, with uh, Rick Vaughn, the wild thing. And they're like, get me Vaughn. And then the music comes on. And I went, huh? Oh, shit. Wild thing, right? Wild thing, Rob Wilds. Holy shit. And that just stuck. Now, as far as biting off anybody's look, no, never. Never, never their look, never their character. Their wrestling style. Dude, for my first two years, you would think I was just blatantly ripping off Bret Hart, Macho Man, and Rick Rude. It was horrible. I didn't have a move of my own. But I did him in the right order, and it got me over. <laughs> wow. Um, so when you left the business, how did you replace that sort of high of going out performing in front of people? Because I bet that must have been a big void in your life at the time. Co fucking Kane. <laughs> I can not You hear a lot of pop stars generally who perform in front of large crowds every week. Once they leave, that's the choice they turn into because they need something to replace that that buzz of you're you're up there one minute and then it's, it's all taken away. So my problem though was wild thing wasn't just a gimmick anymore it be, it had become who i was so i mean you like because you know i i did my co fucking cane in the business but it wasn't an everyday thing my everyday thing was weed but uh because that, that really helped with the natural pains and aches and helps you get out of bed in the morning but uh no, you know, I went back into music and, you know, I opened a karaoke company and I did little things that I could. But then I realized I could make a whole shit lot more money with cocaine. So I did. And I got myself in a lot of trouble and went down some bad holes. And then one day I pulled my head out my ass. See that? Whatever it takes. You can't quite see it's tattoo on the forearm. Whatever it takes. To keep me off cocaine, I'm six years clean on it. Ooh, fucking raw. You guys can do it too. If you are suffering in silence with drug addiction, you do not have to be. There is help for you everywhere. People you would never expect to help you will help you. So just don't do it alone. You can be done. Look at me. I'm a felon. And now I own a podcast network. I work in the financial industry and I'm a homeowner. So you can improve where you're at. That was my PSA. <laughs> I like what you're saying about living up to something. So we're not, between the age of 15 and 22, I found the pub in the UK and I turned into a party animal. But I got given a nickname, <laughs> Burnout. I got it tattooed on my arm like that. <laughs> So yeah, but burnout and burnout was wild. Burnout had to go out and be the first one drunk. Burnout had to burnout had to throw up. Burnout had to stand on bars or music speakers and strip and stuff like that. And I had to better myself each week. And <laughs> like like you said, it turns into that's who you, you turn into. And the way I've I've helped myself separate it now because like my kids come along and my wife and stuff like that. So burnout burnout's within me, but burnout doesn't come out much later. But I talk talk about burnout as a separate person. So this is Lee. And then I, I call it my blowout night. So every six months, I don't drink at home or anything like that because my wife's not a drinker. And then obviously with the illness and stuff like that, things are different anyway. But I, I, I call it a blowout night. So I go every about six months, I go out and I get a night where I get really hammered. It only takes about four drinks now because I'm getting old. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's the Let's night get pissed. Four drinks. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the night burnout comes out. 
and then that gets out of my system, and then I can carry on another six months. Because right. really, I know alcohol weren't the choice, and I think I was running away from a lot of things. Like my mum had left sure. me when I was nine years old. Um, other stuff had gone on and stuff like that. So I think I was just trying to escape from something, but it was fine at the same time. <laughs> like, I can't deny it. I, I had a great time. I'm not trying to promote, go out and be an alcoholic or anything like that. Like my liver was showing on my blood test when I was 20 years old and stuff like that. I used to drink like an animal right. and it would. And my son will never know this, but he saved my life because if he didn't come along, it was choosing between a pack of nappies or a bottle of beer. And as time went on, you picked the nappies and stuff like that. So the alcohol slowly went away, which then made me into a better person. And he now, are nappy, nappies, is that diapers? Yeah, diapers, sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Apologies to keep forgetting. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it was either, yeah, buy a bottle of beer or buy some diapers. So, obviously, I had to pick the diapers and stuff because he didn't choose to come into the world. So, I felt I had a responsibility that I had to do the best by him because he had no choice to, to be born in a way. That was our decision, not his. So, but that helped me switch around. So burnout got put away and Lee came out. I found myself in a way and I am forever grateful to him. I don't think he'd ever realize. Now, you, you, you do realize that you're saying all this on the air. So odds of him finding out are pretty high. Yeah. And but, I do tell him, I don't think he realizes. <laughs> I, think he, I, think, I think he realized when he goes through some stuff. But I tell him like stories of the past and how when he came along, my life changed. And I'm like, you saved me. And he's like, yeah, all right. Like, typical teenager. You're whatever, Dad. And it goes off to play computer. So, <laughs> You know what actually made me pull my head out of my ass all the way? The final straw was uh, my dad was dying. Yeah, pancreatic cancer. So I sit down with him and I say, look, I want you to know that when the worst happens, I'm going to be here to care for mom. And he said, oh, yeah? In between what? Your trips to jail or your trips to the bathroom to push that shit up your nose? I don't need your fucking help. We got it. And I was devastated. And I vanished from my family's sight for like three months. I was so mortified. And that was really my inspiration to uh, just to be done with it all. So when I got clean, you know, I was clean for about six months. I'm sitting with my dad outside of Panera Bread. And I said, you know, I, I know we talked about this once before. It didn't go well. But the same thing applies that I'm here to take care of things when you're gone. He said, well, I know you will. I knew that you were going to get your head pulled out of your ass. So my dad's uh, final move exiting this world was saving my life. Wow. it's amazing. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, uh, the network. So we obviously met through a post that you put on uh, Facebook. And it was really weird because I think a day or two before that, I had been in talks with this other network company and they were like giving me all the spiel and it's going to be great and stuff like that so i got i had a video meeting i got to the point where i was about to join and they sent over this contract thing and it was about taking all our so over our social medias right in a way, taking the content and then i see your post and i just thought and i contacted you and then i was like how does this work and you explained and i'm like yeah what's the catch and it's like no catch brother I'm like we're looking for great creators we'll share the page with you. It's your content. You do with it. Just like, obviously create, create shows and that. And how did that idea come about? Because like I just said, you don't own none of our stuff. Right. Well, uh, um, being in entertainment as long as I have, I know how fucking frustrating it is for somebody to tell you oh yeah come over and shine your light with us oh but put this lampshade on first and here are the rules to what you're allowed to do over here the, the, i said this the other day to somebody one of the keys i think to the success of the network has been the fact that we have recruited people who like ourselves who have managed to harness our mental illnesses right and <laughs> focus that into a positive entertaining direction artistic freedom artistic expression freedom of speech these aren't these aren't buzzwords you understand these are fundamentals of the company 
I know that started the uh, this other network with this other piece of shit who I'm not going to give any press to. This guy worked very, very hard to stifle the forward movement of this network. He wanted us to play by the rules we were trying to start out with, but he's going to, it's like he was afraid of success. So he was sabotaging it intentionally. So we left. I had to just start this thing and we pained over the name for a while. But then I was like, you know what? The antisocial network, I know it's a book, but it encapsulates the very presence. And the thing is, is, Idiots like former hosts we've had who could go on their little independent shows who get like 12, maybe 15 views a month want to bash us. But the proof's in the pudding. The formula works, and the formula is very simple. You do not want a whole bunch of people doing shows that sounds like it's all coming from the same guy because the same mind is trying to tell everybody what y'all are allowed to and not to do. We all celebrate each other's success together. And guess what? We all take each other's failures together. And we're a very tight knit group over here. Everybody is always trying to help the next guy, trying to help promote their show, promote their own show, push the network, push the greater success of the beast. So everybody gets to eat on the pie. So, oh, um, are you still looking for creators to join the network? And if so, how do they how do they go about it? Well, well they can hit you up. They can hit me up. They, we don't. The only limits that we impose to our creators here is we are not going to do anything that's going to focus on religion or politics. You know, that's that's really not a safe zone. And I'm not worried about backlash on us. I'm worried about backlash on the creator. So we're just going to avoid that problem. I've been in entertainment long enough to know what some of those no fly zones actually are. But uh, yeah, I mean, we like we love more women. We have recently recruited quite a few new ladies to join the network. We put the promotion machine of the network behind everybody who's on here because again we all enjoy success together or we all suffer defeat together i've got one last question to ask and this is a question i ask every guest um your answer will not change your life journey so far but if you had 30 seconds with your 13 year old self what would you say go get a college degree boy and uh i would say definitely follow through with your professional wrestling. You are going to have the opportunity to wrestle people that you have been watching your whole life. But wrestling is brutal and it's painful and it's entertainment. So it's vicious. So get your, get yourself your education right along with pursuing the wrestling business. And well, if well, I was, if, if 13 year old Rob said degree in what? Marketing. Go. Boof. <laughs> exactly. Who would know the world was heading <laughs> heading this way all that years ago? But well, Rob, thank you so much for uh, joining us here on the Non-Identity Podcast. Thank you for allowing us. Show. 